Good morning. The Lord reveals himself. Our Savior reveals himself as the Savior for the sins of the whole world. Typically, when you watch a production, a play, the main character is revealed with great pomp and circumstance. Or you think of a coronation or a new president, there is a great celebration honoring him. But our Savior reveals himself in humility. How strange. The focus was on us. His revealing himself was for you. We begin singing, Dearest Jesus, we are here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is able and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father.
our gracious Father in heaven, has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ faithful in our calling as your children and make us heirs with him of everlasting life. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
Our first lesson, Isaiah 42, 1 through 7. Note how all of our lessons link together this morning. What we need, God provides. God provides righteousness to us through his servant. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. And in his teachings, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I... The Lord have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. The word of the Lord. We continue now with Psalm 45, Great are the works of the Lord. You are the most excellent of men. Gird your sword on your side, you mighty one. The the works of the Lord. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. When Jesus ushered in righteousness, he ushered it in for the whole world, both Jew and Gentile alike. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 38. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. 
The Holy Gospel, Matthew 3, 13 to 17, the account of Jesus being baptized by John. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. Please be sing, seated. We sing by faith. Children of the congregation, I invite you to come forward.
mom and dad, mom or dad, takes care of it when you're at home. When you're at school and you trip and fall and skin your knee, maybe Mrs. Seeley takes care of it or your teacher takes care of it. I went over to the TK room looking for one of these this morning, but I couldn't find one. Must be hidden in a special place. Do you have any idea what I might be referring to? Something that mom and dad might put over a skin knee, or a teacher might do it. A band-aid. And what's the point of the band-aid? Well, one, it's to stop the blood, but it's hopeful that it will make you all right, that it will heal you in time, that your skin will come back together as God designed you so wonderfully to heal. They place a Band-Aid on it. And when you skin your knee or you rub your elbow and get a bruise or you get hurt in any way, what's the first question when you might be crying? Are you all right? Right? They want to show that they love you and that they'll take care of you. They ask you, are you all right? Hmm. We've got something much worse than a skinned knee or a bruised elbow. And every single one of us has this thing that hurts us and injures us spiritually. And it needs something far better than a band-aid. It needs healing only God can bring. Because when we're hurt spiritually, it means we're never on our own going to be all right with God. God demands that we have no scar of sin, no open wound or bruise or skin knee. God demands us to be perfect in his sight. So can we ever be all right on our own? Can anyone be bandages us up and heal us. We can't have any band-aids in God's eyes for our sin. But that's what we learn about in our lesson today. Jesus, as he comes to be baptized, does it to make you all right in God. He doesn't put any band-aid on you. He actually takes away that wound of sin and makes you perfect by covering you to make you all right with God by his perfect life. And one of the ways he gives that to you is he connects you to his baptism that makes you all right with God through your baptism. Because you are baptized, Jesus' righteousness is making you all right with God, covers you over. And you are God's dear child. Amen? Okay, go back to your seats. Praise the one who breaks the darkness.
Grace, mercy, and peace belong to you through God our Father, from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember that promise of Isaiah in the name who has promised, I the Lord have called you in righteousness. I will take a hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open the eyes that are blind, to free the captives from prison, and to release you from the dungeon, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness, dear children of God adopted into God's family through holy baptism. Throughout my years of being a pastor, and especially in a situation where it was immediately intense to grow the local congregation, I spent a lot of my time seeking out ways to break down barriers. To read books about how I can remove obstacles, rub shoulders with people, and look for opportunities to share the gospel, the word of Jesus, the only thing that matters for eternity. One of those ideas that I had and I was willing to carry out, and I had a personal need for, because of my situation, was the desire to use up meet up. Do you remember meet up? It became a thing on the internet where you could develop a group of people who had a common interest in almost anything to get together and enjoy that common interest while at the same time expand their relationships with new people. A meetup for German Fest. A meetup for chess. A meetup for outdoor exercise in the park, whatever it might be. If you had a common interest, you were welcome to come and join the group. didn't work as well as I wanted it to. It was a strategy for personal reasons, to gain a deeper depth of relationships with people, but it was also for service in the ministry reasons to proclaim the gospel, but it didn't work out. There's books that come out every year about how to share the gospel in the most effective and efficient way there's examinations as to why people are not joining the church from the outside and why the church is actually losing people from within. And do you know what the number one reason is that most people claim that they want nothing to do with the church? It's that old thing of hypocrisy. They view Christians as people who have a set of guidelines and obedience necessary to those guidelines, and yet while they actually observe them in Christian life, they don't see them practicing what they claim to believe. They're not practicing what they're preaching. They're all hypocrites. You and I can confess you and I can understand their point. But the reason why is completely different than what they are thinking. A hypocrite is someone who says one thing and claims it to be right and doesn't practice it, but that does not mean that they negate that what God has said is true and correct. The real realization or why we can sympathize with them is because of our sinful weakness. Our actions don't fall in line 
100% of the time because we are weighed down with sinful flesh that loves to do what's evil in the eyes of the Lord. But that does not negate the new person in us that says, Lord, your ways are always true and correct. Your will is infallible. What is infallible is my keeping it. This morning, let us encourage ourselves with the account of Jesus' baptism. Let us join the meetup once again. A meetup that happened in the desert 2,000 years ago. And recognize it's not what we are doing in baptism. It is what God is doing for us. We heard the account of John the Baptist, the all prophets, as we prepared our hearts for Christmas. But time has passed. Now we are in Epiphany, where Jesus, at the proper time, reveals himself as God's anointed one. Yes, there were probably many people going out to the desert at John's time to see that radical clothing. There were probably also people going out to the desert to see what was on his desert plate. But we would be false to conclude that there weren't those who were going to the desert to be baptized for what God gives. You see, the weird thing about Christians is that God gives us a healthy dose of medicine and comes to us and speaks clearly to us about our need to repent. That we haven't done what God has demanded of us. And even though that's a message that is grating to us naturally, it's joy to us as Christians because we know that that message of our own sinfulness only underscores more and more the need for a Savior. A Savior that we cling to as that song by faith, whom we understand who he was and what he has done to us, done for us. So then we understand John's surprise. One whom he know, knew was the fulfillment of all God's promises as a savior from sin, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and yet Jesus approaches John and requests to be baptized. John was preaching a baptism of repentance to acknowledge, first, God's sin, our sin, and second, the forgiveness that comes to that individual by grace. Jesus, why are you here? Jesus, you don't have need for every, anything that I'm offering. My preaching, John must have thought, does not apply to you. Jesus, what are you doing? I don't understand this thing. And then Jesus responds to him in the only way that makes sense. He says, let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, you're exactly right, John. I have no sin of my own. I don't have a single thing for which to repent. The reason we are doing this is to fulfill all righteousness. To put my pl myself in the place of every human being and win righteousness for them. I have come to do what they could not do for themselves to make them right with God. 
that's something we couldn't do even if we were baptized every day of our life. Though we live in our baptisms and remember what baptism has done for us, we could not do what God, the Son of God, was doing. That's what those who claim us to be hypocrites don't understand. Our faith, our religion, is not simply a rule book by which to live. It's not a checklist of things that I should do if I'm a good Christian. Baptism is not what we are doing for God, but what God has done for us to fulfill all righteousness. In a miraculous way, Jesus stands there and makes his righteousness available to the whole world. Not simply by carrying their sins off to a cross in the future, but by obeying perfectly on their behalf to obtain that perfect record. This is the beginning of the end. Jesus revealed an epiphany anointed by God with a mission to the cross. In a very real sense, it was a portal to what all God would do for us. All my guilt, all my shortcomings, all my failures were laid on him and for which he was sacrificed. Jesus is on point. Let us attend that meetup in the desert. Let's attend that meetup in the wilderness because God in the flesh humbles himself and starts his ministry as the suffering servant. We don't look any different than the world in which we live, do we? We're not a made-up cult or religion that has rules that you must dress in a certain way. We don't walk around our community with robes or vestments that distinguish us as human beings in our society. We don't have certain ordinances that we must carry out in order to show ourselves to the world and be a light for the Gentiles. But oh, how sad it would be if we were not seen as different. Oh, how sad it would be if we were not that annoying person on the 78 that cuts you off at 95 miles an hour and sways into your lane right in front of you because they're frustrated with how slowly you're driving. Oh, how sad it would be if we were not somehow distinguished from that customer at the store that jots in line right in front of you. Oh, how sad it would be if we were not somewhat dim different than that pro co-worker who underskirts you in order to make himself more visible and more valuable in the workplace. Oh, how sad it would be if we weren't some way distinguished by these things. Baptism is God's doing for us, not our doing for him. Jesus was baptized to fulfill all your righteousness.
So if we talk about Jesus' baptism, and it might be wise for us to remember what happened at our baptisms. After all, we enter God's presence in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. After all, we remember our baptisms as we daily drown the old man so that the new man might arise. What happened in our baptism? That too is not your doing for God, but it is what God has done for you. Your baptism connects you to Christ's baptism. That sinful human being that approaches the font is washed clean of their sins, God promises. God promises that they receive the righteous robes of Christ and are now a child of God. Baptism means that instead of being last name, whatever it might be, God's name is superimposed, and that child is now a baptized child of God. Precious in the sight of your Holy Father. And baptism empowers us. As the Spirit descended on Jesus and empowered him, your baptism empowers you daily to be who you truly are. First and foremost, in all settings of life, not depending on your hairstyle or your clothing, you are God's child, empowered with a new man to live a life that rejoices in things completely upside down. To disassociate yourself from the me first society in which we live. As Christ humbled himself, you are empowered to humble yourselves that others may go first. In Christ's baptism, you received the power of compassion. For those that are not turning their life to like you'd have them see them live it, but it to encourage and understand them and love them despite their actions. Your baptism has power in your everyday life. Remember it. Wake up in it. Close your eyes in it every night. Excuse me, or pardon me if I've said this before, I probably have, but when you remember something for 47 years or 48 years or whatever, it might have had impact. Whenever I left in the community, my father said, remember whose son you are. And yes, I'm sure he had some motives in that, that he did not want any of his children publicly bringing disgrace to him as a pastor. But at a much deeper level, I believe that he was reminding me that not Pastor Trader's son, but God's son. Remember whose child you are when you are out in this world so that, as Isaiah said, the Gentiles might have a light in their darkness. The result being that those who are enslaved with the chains of sin might be released by the power of a gracious Savior who won righteousness and was righteousness for them, who begins now on his mission with the end in sight to release them from their sins for eternity. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, you are God's dear child. Amen.
Please stand as we confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptism. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor, guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those who work is difficult or dangerous. Comfort all who are in sorrow or in need, sickness and adversity. We especially remember this morning Lloyd Prosser, who is suffering from an infection of lung embolism and is trying to return to help. Be with Vicki as she attends to the need of her husband in this time of sickness. And we ask, according to your will, that you may restore him. In Jesus' name, remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living in sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Please be seated at this time. We'll please take a few moments of silence to remember all the gracious gifts our Father has given us and also return to him our offering.
Father. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Be seated as we sing good news of God above. eternal King and gracious Father, in love you made us the crown of your creation, in mercy you planned for our salvation, in grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks for that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on the cross, that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deep our, deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us into his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God, our Father, and to your Son, and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look at you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We sing, baptized into your holy, most holy name. Please be seated. <laughs> 